Welcome to Leesburg Public Library and this month's installment from Tom Wilcox Presents. Tom Wilcox, our reference librarian who's retired, is continuing to provide his history lessons each month that we are recording. This month, learn about Washington didn't sleep here. Enjoy. Hey, hi. Well, as you see by this title here, it's good to be back. It's uh, George Washington did not sleep here, but this is where he did and why. And uh, before I go into it, I'm indebted to quite a few sources, which I have to mention. Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons has been very, very good with some information. Uh, for instance, Wikipedia has an entire timeline showing all of Washington's headquarters and when he was there and some of the most important things that happened there. I use some other sources like visitbookscounty.com. Um, I also have uh, a few, uh, another one called visitphilly.com, New York Public Library, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of different places. So I just wanted to get that all out and this is where we go, come on, there we go. All right, this is the first place he slept in. This is where he was born in Wakefield Plantation in Westmoreland County. Um, that's quite a history in that place because Robert E. Lee was also born there. And uh, it's a, I actually stayed there. They have this uh, beautiful state park there and it's a beautiful area if you ever want to go there. And, you know, Basically, this is about George Washington, but we're putting in a little Black History Month here because he was born in, lived in, and died in a slave holding society. And you'll see some of the ways he had to navigate it. On a more positive side, he actually had a body servant who must have been very young because in 1855, I saw a contemporary newspaper article that said he had just died. He was 95 years old. His name was George. He didn't have a last name. Uh, he was, but he was with the general uh, everywhere. And this is some of what he saw. He said that uh, he recollected the first and second installations in death of President Washington, the surrender of Cornwallis, the battles of Trenton and Monmouth, the sufferings of the Patriot Army at Valley Forge, the proclamation of the Declaration of Independence. George was there for all of that. And this is where he last lived. This is Mount Vernon uh, in Fairfax County, near, very near Washington. Actually, it's like maybe 15, 20 miles away from the city. And uh, he died December 14th, 1799. And uh, you can go and visit it today. And lately, all these old Southern plantations, they've been sort of emphasizing the lives of the bound people rather than the more known masters as the Washingtons were. In fact, Martha Washington bought 30 slaves into the marriage when she married George. She was literally the richest woman in the colony of Virginia. And we'll cover more of that later. And uh, okay, now we're gonna see the rest of it. <laughs> you know, we're gonna see the most important places because I cannot name every single place he was at because he was always on the move and we'll, we'll talk more about that. And uh, we're covering the most important places. And there were a couple of important places where he was not at, but still had to be mentioned. Okay, now this is the thing that launched him onto the world stage. He was 22 years old and he was sent out by the governor of Virginia to see what the French were doing in the Ohio Valley. Because in those days, Virginia claimed basically all the land almost uh, to the Great Lakes. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite something. And this is a reconstructed fort. They actually found the remains of the original fort and he somehow managed to shoot and kill the leader of a, the French expedition named Jumonville. And I mean, that literally sparked what we now know as the French and Indian War. And uh, he, it, it is the only surrender in his entire military career. Um, 
he actually wrote a very boastful letter to one of his younger brothers saying that he had heard the sound of battle and there were uh, bullets in battle and there was something charming in the sound. And I couldn't find document this, but according to anecdotally, King George II, you know, uh, remarked that he would not have thought so if he had heard many. <laughs> But uh, in that time, uh, they uh, it started this whole big war, not only on the frontier, but in Europe. It was called the Seven Years' War. So it really was one of the first global wars. And there he was right in the middle of it. And this is interesting because sometimes headquarters wasn't actually a house. It was a tent. And they actually have some in uh, the Museum of Pennsylvania at Valley Forge that are preserved from his time. And the caption says it was a marquee. And uh, we uh, recently found a show on the Roku channel called Don't Tell the Bride, where the show is in the UK, the show gives them money, uh, but the groom plans the wedding. Wedding venue, reception, bachelorette party, and the gowns. It's very funny. But uh, uh, some of these uh, guys rented what they call a marquee, a big tent to have the wedding in. Okay, well, George again <laughs> entered the public sphere. Uh, General Braddock was sent with a large expedition to really totally engage the French and drive them out of what the English considered to be their territory in 1755, and it turned into a massive rout. Uh, contemporaries described that uh, Washington on his horse was shot at several times, somehow not getting seriously hurt. One of his horses was shot out from under him, and yet he, he took over from his dying general and managed to get the army together to bring them back to the capital. And uh, it, it made his name again, it really did. But after that, he, uh, because of the things, uh, to be an officer in the British army, you had to come from a well-connected family who had money to buy a commission. He didn't have the money and being a colonial, he wasn't allowed to really do something like that. So he decided to retire. He resigned his commission. He uh, met uh, Martha Custis, who was the richest widow in the colony of Virginia. And to be honest, from what I've read, George was rather a dark horse in the, the widow marriage sweepstakes, but somehow they just seemed to make this connection. And he just forged out all head of the competition, which was considerable. And uh, they were married in 1759. But uh, so he was this retired planter. He kept his farm tilled by his and Martha's slaves at Mount Vernon. And, uh, but events would soon take him in hand. And uh, in the Continental Congress in uh, 1775, uh, war had effectively broken out at the battles of Lexington and Concord. And the British were holed up in Boston with literally thousands of colonial militia hemming them in and uh, they didn't know quite what to do. And that's when Congress, which was really basically the only government we had, what we now know of as the Supreme Court and an executive didn't occur till after the war and after the constitution. And uh, so Congress was the, the government and they, uh, he lobbied so hard that he went to meetings dressed in his Virginia militia uniform just to give it the point. And John Adams wisely said that in order to make this work, we must have a man from the South. So this red state, blue state thing actually in some ways started very, very early. And this is from Wikipedia. They have a timeline. They show every single place 
where he was. This is just 1778. This is only part of 1778. And you see how many places. It's like one, two, three, four, five. It's like seven or eight of them. So uh, he, he was on the move. And there was a good reason for that because King George sent 48,000 men in three separate armies to subdue the rebellion in America, to restore the, the, the colonies to his rule. And Washington somehow had to keep an army together, to keep it in the field, to keep people contributing money, flour, cattle, whatever they, they could do to make this a going concern. There's this uh, anecdotal story that when the Defense Department converted to computers in the 60s, they put in all the perimeters of the American Revolution. And according to the computer, we lost. So it was really <laughs> a wing and a prayer at times. And I think you'll see that. Um, now, this is his first headquarters in Boston. And he was there uh, 1775 to 1776. And this was later owned by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, the 1994 film, Little Women, used this house. And uh, so you, he, luckily, many of his headquarters are still in existence. So you can actually go and see them. And uh, I'm gonna cover this a little more if you happen to be tuning in in April or something, because uh, one of the, the most treacherous pieces of uh, espionage and betrayal that ever happened to the American cause was here. Uh, someone in Boston who literally moved at the very highest circles of Patriot society was working for the British. So I'll, I'll go into more of that. But what he did while he was here, he forced the British to leave uh, Boston. This is how he did it. He got cannon uh, uh, dragged from Fort Ticonderoga, several hundred miles away in New York State, and posted them on Dorchester. All right, I said it wrong. You're supposed to say Dorchester, but uh, <laughs> and he had them pointing down at the city, and the British had no choice. They had to stay. What they did is that they uh, 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 boarded their ships and left. Uh, Abigail Adams witnessed that. She wrote her husband in Philadelphia that it had happened. And uh, they sailed away. And it wasn't exactly a victory yet because it was already known that they were going to Halifax in Nova Scotia and they were waiting for a British fleet to meet them, to sail back down to recommence the war. And the next stop was New York City. And this is where Washington was. Uh, it's uh, around the vicinity of Varick Street on the west side of Manhattan. It's not there anymore. So, you know, not all of them were kept, but uh, uh, you know, John and Abigail Adams stayed here. Aaron Burr stayed here. Quite a few luminaries. And you would think somebody would have thought to keep it, but it spent its last years as an inn and eventually it was no longer in the country. I think it was, it was just got surrounded by the city around it. And, uh, but, okay. Now, while he was here, a plot was uncovered to kill Washington and uh, a soldier, a member of his lifeguard, that's what they were known as, you know, like the Secret Service. They were literally Secret Service. They were, they were this close to the general. And uh, the story was is that he poisoned a dish of peas because that was the general's favorite vegetable. And anecdotally, somebody, when they threw it out into the yard and the chickens that ate it died. And as you see, this man, was hanged, his name was Thomas Hickey. And this is where his headquarters was. This was an old Dutch barn in uh, Brooklyn, which was not yet a city. It was just a collection of uh, six small towns. And uh, 
the British landed in my former neighborhood, which is called Bay Ridge Fort Hamilton at the mouth of the harbor. And they, they put in a force of 34,000 men. The British would not attempt an amphibious landing as demanding and complex as this until June 6th, 1944. That's how big a deal this was. And they marched to where the American army was around the present day 30th street. I grew up on 91st street. So it was only a couple of miles, about maybe four. And uh, in Greenwood Cemetery, the highest spot in Brooklyn is known as Battle Hill. And that's where the Americans were watching. And uh, even though we were pretty even, we were nowhere anywhere near evenly matched to meet them. Uh, and uh, Tories, local Tories, had the British guided them through uh, uh, passes that allowed them to surround our army. And they approached us from the rear. And uh, so the Americans just had to retreat in any way they could. And uh, near the present day Third Street and Fourth, ha uh, Fourth Avenue, there's a park where they rebuilt an old house called the Old Stone House of Gowanus. And a pitched battle with a Maryland regiment was fought so hard here that in today's Prospect Park, there is a monument to these people. And people like the DAR and SAR, they actually come up from buses on Maryland, from Maryland to have a ceremony there. And uh, anyway, our army was driven to the Brooklyn Heights and there was no way out. I mean, there were sh British ships in the harbor. The army was surrounding us. And Lord Howe decided, let's stop for the night. We'll, we'll get them in the morning. But it started to rain and big fog came up that night. And Washington took the opportunity to load the entire army. And that includes munitions, men, weapons, cannon carriages, horses, and slipped them over the East River into Manhattan. Now, this is a place that still exists. This is the Morris Schumel Mansion. And uh, he fought small battles all the way up the 11 miles of Manhattan Island to uh, eventually uh, wh what is now known as Washington Heights. And uh, uh, so this is where he, he was there at the time. And Let's see, he also had to withdraw to White Plains and eventually he had to leave New York altogether. New York was in British hands until the last, uh, almost virtually the last day. They left the city on November 25th, 1783, which for over 150 years was actually celebrated as a holiday in New York. I actually knew people who remembered the schools were closed and they would have all these different things going. Uh, but we had to stop it because it conflicted with Thanksgiving and that was causing a lot of confusion. And in 1940, uh, the United States and Britain were allies and basically Washington told us to knock it off. And that's, that was the end of evacuation day. But uh, he eventually wound up going over to New Jersey and heading to Pennsylvania. And this is where he was in Bucks County. And they have six sites according to visit buckscounty.com. And uh, this was one of them. This you can see, it's right on the Delaware River. And uh, it's the Thompson Neely House. And this is where he grouped together to gather the army to cross the Delaware River. And it's not very wide. I mean, it's not like the Mississippi. Uh, you know, if you've crossed over to Withlacoochee, it's probably not quite as even wide as that. <laughs> but it was in the middle of winter. And this was literally a do or die effort because uh, a lot of enlistments, the standard enlistment in those days for militia was 90 days. And a lot of them were coming up and he 
basically told everybody that if they stayed with him, he would promise them a victory. And he was forced to have a battle in the winter time, which was not done. Every, everyone stopped in October. He, he built camps through the snow, waited for the roads to dry up. And generally in May, <laughs> they started the war again. And, uh, but he couldn't have that luxury. Something had to be done. And that's what he did. And of course, this is where it was really important. Uh, it was sort of the climactic comeback because 1776 was a really lousy year for the American cause. And uh, it gave the troops, they were, the troops were recharged. They felt that there was now a purpose. It gave the home front momentum. And most importantly, it excited the interest of the French court because they had been closely watching as French spies observed the Battle of Lexington and reported to their government. They wanted to see if we could possibly beat uh, their arch rival Britain. Okay, now, not all, as you see, not all of these places survived. Uh, and this house uh, was, uh, belonged to the widow Harris and that's where the house stood. And uh, he reported to Congress of his great victory at Trenton. There were actually two Trenton battles. And then he followed up in January with the Battle of Princeton and uh, made the, the British withdraw to New Brunswick and sort of kept them at bay. Okay, now here's where uh, he was in the Battle of the Brandywine because changing tactics, uh, the British decided that they were going to uh, try to attack uh, and take over Philadelphia, which was the, our capital, it was our largest city, it was our capital, it's where Congress sat in Independence Hall, which you can still go and see. and. Uh, now, George didn't really want to commit to a battle here. He didn't think it, it was possible to win it because he was outnumbered. But uh, Congress said, well, you have to do it. And he firmly believed in civilian authority over the military. And uh, once again, the British took an alternate route, caught us from behind. And uh, Washington was forced to withdraw. And in this battle, the, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was 19 at the time, he had voluntarily joined the American cause. And he was spent, he lived in this house with Washington. And he was wounded in the battle, but he, of course, recovered. And uh, Philadelphia was taken over. So we lost New York, we lost Philadelphia. There wasn't too much else left. <laughs> And he tried again on the outskirts. Now it's in the city of Philadelphia, Germantown, but then it was outside. And uh, he fought a, a major battle. And actually there's a park there having a colonial era house that uh, you can actually see bullet marks on the brick. Because uh, I mean, the battle was fought right in the middle, of, literally in their front yard. Hey, well, here we go to Valley Forge and uh, the army stayed here while the British occupied Philadelphia. It's about 25 miles west of the city. And uh, he had a lot of problems. I mean, uh, one of his biggest headaches throughout the entire war is really sort of getting people on the same with, as we call with the program. Uh, he had to rely on Congress who really didn't have the kind of powers we now expect over different states. And uh, every state was sort of doing its own thing. And uh, there's even a letter from Benjamin Franklin. He was negotiating for a, a French frigate in order to uh, convert it to a warship in Paris and uh, a representative from the state of South Carolina offered more cash and beat him to it. So it, it, was, it was a big problem getting munitions, supplies, flour, all of the bacon, all the things uh, an army needed. 
And so the winter was quite severe. And this was the next place, this is the next wintering encampment and that house is still there, it's called the John Wallace House. And uh, according to their website, the Wallace House Society, uh, the family were going to rent it out to the Washingtons and were planning to move to Philadelphia while they occupied it, but that was out because the British were there. So everybody, everybody stayed there. <laughs> And uh, this is, uh, there were two uh, encampments in Morristown, New Jersey. And Morristown, which is about 20 something miles west of New York, was a good spot because this way he was far enough from the British reach, but still close enough to be able to keep an eye on them. And actually that's where he got a lot of intelligence by his spy network about what was happening in the city. And, he had a big problem with uh, smallpox. That was a constant problem. And actually it was so bad that he ordered the troops, everybody had to be vaccinated. And uh, what they did then is that they gave you a, a dose of the cowpox and it would get you sick, but you, you probably wouldn't die. And he had natural immunity because he had smallpox as a young man. Uh, that was the good thing. The bad thing was is that it probably made him sterile because he and Martha never had any children. What children he had were actually hers from her previous marriage. And this is where Martha comes in. Uh, she was uh, at every, every winter encampment and uh, she liked going there. Her family tried to get her to stay at home. Uh, and. Uh, she literally would load two carriages full of whatever supplies she thought they would need. And she was escorted by a six man special cavalry. And now to get from, I looked this up on MapQuest and to get from Mount Vernon, Virginia to Morristown, New Jersey, which is North Jersey is just a touch over 241 miles. And that's roughly about a four hour drive today with our roads and our cars and everything. But I would estimate it could be at least nine to 10 days. And I mean, there were so many hazards on the road, a uh, wagon carriage wheels could break. Um, there were marauders, deserters running around foraging off the land who would rob them. The British could have scooped them up anytime, uh, but that never happened. They never, she never was threatened by the, the, the British at all. Either they didn't think she was worth the effort or they probably respected her position and let her go unhindered. And uh, that's, that's where she was with George. And this was, uh, uh, now Mount Vernon was really, really bad. Jockey Hollow near Morristown was much, much worse. The winter of 1779, 1780 was so bad, the ice, uh, the river and the uh, bay in New York City froze. The British sent sledges five miles over the ice to Staten Island to get much needed firewood. And at the time, uh, New York City was about the size of a good middle-sized, uh, you know, uh, community, you know, housing development. But uh, there were a lot of problems. And this is what she said, that the distress of the army and the general was so unhappy and that it distressed her. And uh, these are reconstructed cabins that the men made for themselves. They cut down 2000 acres of trees to make those. And this is where we were getting closer to Yorktown because there were things that were happening that he was not at. One of them was the Battle of Saratoga and General Gates and General uh, Benedict Arnold actually managed to uh, capture uh, Sir, Ger Ger Sir John Burgoyne's army 
known as Gentleman Johnny. <laughs> and so they eliminate one of the three armies sent to subdue the rebellion. And uh, they just had to worry about the other two. And one was less of a problem. Sir Henry Clinton decided that he liked his birth in New York and seldom left New York with his army. Uh, I mean, there were times like I used to live in, in Metuchen, New Jersey, and there were uh, uh, quite a few guerrilla style warfare. Uh, Westchester County had quite a bit. And uh, so there was, there was a lot of stuff going on, but eventually he left the campaign in the South because by 1779, the British thought, well, we're not having much, very much luck here in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Let's, let's go to what they considered to be the more loyal colonies in the South. But uh, that didn't work out so well. In fact, there's a house near Williamsburg uh, and it's called Carter's Grove Plantation. And you can actually see the hoof print of a British officer's horse shoe and he tried to ride it up the stairway and the banister is slashed from his saber. I mean, it's really cool to see. And so that really, I mean, it really was a disastrous campaign for them because a lot of people who were middle road, who were just sort of sitting around waiting to see how it would go, suddenly became radicalized. Um, I had an ancestor who lived in Virginia at the time, and that's when he joined, and he uh, served three 90-day tours. He fought in the Virginia backcountry. He fought in the uh, state of North Carolina backcountry. He fought in what is now the state of Tennessee, and uh, he was present at a treaty with the Cherokee Nation, and uh, I mean, uh, until 1779, he spent the first three years of the war just, you know, all right, let's see where it goes. Well, he made his choice. <laughs> but what happened was in uh, climactic battles, like the Battle of Calpens, uh, General Nathaniel Green, one of the best generals we ever had, managed to slowly push everybody uh, towards Virginia because by this time, France had recognized us. They were going to help us. They were sending men, munitions, food. And uh, if you notice, Yorktown is a peninsula and uh, they actually had a French fleet and the French West Indies that with good weather could definitely beat another fleet coming from England to rescue Cornwallis. And Cornwallis had appealed to Henry Clinton to send troops. And as he had done with uh, Sir John Burgoyne, he said, well, no, not really. <laughs> he stayed. But what happened was is that the British fleet, the French fleet got there, the British fleet totally blocked up the, the waterways, we surrounded them. And if you go to uh, Yorktown Park, you can actually see the ramparts uh, and they still exist because they were actually still in good shape 80 years later and were rebuilt and repurposed for our own civil war. And uh, this was a rather palatial place. Uh, they lived here near the Princeton area uh, for a while because uh, uh, the Pennsylvania troops of the Continental Army hadn't been paid in a year and they threatened to march on Philadelphia and hold basically hold a gun to Congress's head to get their money. And so uh, uh, the president of Congress, his name is Elias Boudinow, he, he wrote to Washington urgently to send loyal troops and to uh, make sure he was within range because Congress had fled to um, Princeton, New Jersey said, no, come to us because, uh, and this is very, very important because everyone was already looking forward to if we won the war of having a place for a national capital and places like Princeton, New York, Philadelphia, they were all in the running. 
and uh, this is uh, where, and they would stay there for quite a while. They, they were there like about six months. And uh, what happened was, is that they stayed there long enough. Both he and Martha had uh, portraits done. Uh, they had a number of famous visitors like uh, Boudinow was there. Uh, one of the local gentry, Anna Stockton, her uh, late husband was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and Richard Stockton was big enough to actually rate a town. It's on the Delaware River on the New Jersey side. And uh, it's a very charming little town. And uh, they actually have an inn there that it has notoriety of being the location for the Rogers and Hart song, There's a Small Hotel. And it does have a wishing well. <laughs> and this was his last wartime headquarters. And it's not there anymore. It's in the basically the location of Third Avenue and Canal Street. And Washington sort of had to cool his heels there and wait till the British actually all marched onto the ships. And it, it was quite an undertaking. The year before in 1782, 29 ships full of Tory refugees left the port. I mean, it was, it was a mass evacuation. Very few people managed to stay. Uh, and uh, people remember which, who they supported, which side they were on. And they did profit from being, you know, collaborators with the British. And it was time for a reckoning. So there they are waiting, hanging out. And it was a tavern, probably had some drinks. And uh, finally, when the British finally did, they left the parting gift for the new United States. And uh, by the old Ford in Battery Park, there a, was a flagpole. And when they reverently withdrew their flag, they removed all the, the ropes and halyards and greased the pole so that we would be unable to raise our flag. And somehow with a concerted effort, all of its troops, they just literally climbed on top of each other, making this man mountain. And there's a 19th century print of a, a young man at the top hammering the flag in with hammer and nails. And you could see the sailing ship. So the British definitely saw that. So here we are after the war, Washington bid a tearful, <laughs> farewell at a dinner uh, and uh, I think they went through like 20 cases of champagne and quite a lot of brandy and he retired again to private life and in the meantime uh, Congress created the government we have today they created an executive department and a judiciary and uh, that's when he was called back into service he did not want to be president of the United States but he was so well known that he was just by acclamation. And of course the dynamic, you know, as Adams had originally said, we must have a man that the South will accept and they would. And so this is where he went to, to live. They got a place for him and uh, the Washingtons took up residence on a house uh, on Cherry Street, which is now the lower East side. And what happened was, is that it turned out, like I said, there's no pun intended in Cherry, that was the name of the street, but Congress refitted the house. They actually extended the drawing room to fit the Washington's needs uh, for receptions and everything. But I think George didn't want to stay there because the Congress was in the old city hall on Wall Street. And according to MapQuest, it's um, just a touch over a mile and a half, which doesn't sound much. It's like maybe eight, nine minutes by car, depending on New York traffic. But uh, I'd say with a carriage and team, be closer to 25. And I think he thought it was just way too far and the house was way too small. And uh, And this is what happened to Cherry Street. 
it, it actually lasted until 1856, the house, and it was torn down to make tenements. And then eventually even the tenements were raised to make the anchorage for the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is the second house they got from, uh, and that was at 39 Broadway, uh, much closer to where he wanted to be. And uh, it, this is a 19th century, it was called the, the, the Federal Court. And uh, this is, shows the Washingtons entertaining all the glitterati of the, <laughs> of the new federal government. Although I think that's probably a little more uh, fancier than probably the house was. And believe it or not, strangely enough, this house lasted till 1940. <laughs> Okay, this is the place here, he really didn't sleep. <laughs> and this was called the government house. And this is where the sweepstakes came in. Uh, New York was so desperately eager to have the capital stay in New York that they actually on their own built an executive mansion for the president, a permanent, that would have been our permanent White House. Uh, although probably they would have needed something much bigger. As you can see the problem, it was already surrounded by buildings. One of the advantages to Washington, um, the present White House grounds are 17 acres. And uh, there was, I mean, it was, op it was open land. They had to, of course, purchase it, but they didn't, they weren't surrounded by houses. So he never slept there. It was never used for any federal purpose whatsoever. And eventually it was torn down. And the government moved as per agreement to Philadelphia. And uh, that's where the Washington spent part of his, his uh, time, his, you know, a good deal of his first and his second administrations, which ended in 1797. And while he was there, he had uh, two slaves. And one of them was his cook called Hercules, which everyone called Uncle Harkness. And he was, Hercules was of such stature that it was an extremely rare thing, but he was actually paid a salary and he spent all of it on fine clothes. And he was supposed to have cut quite a striking figure on the streets of Philadelphia. And uh, he waited, he served the president all the time until uh, on George Washington's birthday, according to mountvernon.org, he's listed in the record books as uh, February 22nd, 1797. He's listed as absconded and nobody ever heard of him again. So Washington lost one. And then Mrs. Washington's maid also left. Her name was Oni Judge because, uh, and there was a real reason. There were two things that were going on. Uh, first of all, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania had a law that if a slave lived in the vicinity for more than six months, they could sue for their freedom and it would be granted. So the North was already turning away from the institution of slavery, which had never really been a huge thing for them anyway. And uh, she decided to leave because uh, uh, she was going to, uh, Martha was going to give her to her uh, granddaughter on her marriage. And she liked, I think she liked Martha well enough, but from what I understand, she did not want to be with the more temperamental granddaughter. I think her name was Nellie. And that's what they called her. I think her, and so she decided to leave. And of course she had spent enough time there. There were 6,000 free blank, uh, blacks in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia at the time. And they had this network to get her away. They actually got her up to New Hampshire. And uh, I mean, Washington actually wanted uh, the US Federal Marshal Service to retrieve her and bring her back. And of course, today that would be an egregious executive breach, but it was so new, nobody quite knew where the boundaries were. And, uh, but uh, luckily abolition, well, not exactly abolition, but uh, you know, emancipation fever was very rife. And 
somehow or other they protected her they didn't they ignored his so-called subpoenas and uh, she never got sent back i mean even his heir after his death tried tried to get her back and she let, spent the rest of her life in new hampshire and this is uh, where the house stood. This is a, a representation built, and you can see how close it is to Federal Hall. And uh, and this is a little trick that Washington's used for people like Oni uh, to get past the six month rule. They rotated them back to Mount Vernon when they were getting close to the six month time so that they could never actually walk into a court and say, oh, well, I've been here longer than six months. I want to be free. So they work the system. And this is where it ended. This is a, a contemporary print of Washington die on his deathbed in Mount Vernon. And you can actually see it. Uh, it's really, it's a nice room, but compared to, you know, uh, a lot of other places where presidents owned later on it's really relatively modest but it's quite something to see and this is the end this is his and martha's tomb uh and it's on the property because uh mrs washington who outlived him by two years was actually approached they wanted to build this grand monument to him and have it as not only a monument but a tomb and she seemed receptive to the idea but i mean there were no real plans uh no no funds and actually it never happened in her lifetime what did happen is the present washington monument a private group started to build it in 1848 and uh, ran out of money. And so there's this stump <laughs> about a quarter of the way up. And it wasn't, the present monument wasn't finished until 1884 when the government took it over and said, we have to get this built, it's embarrassing. And so it's a monument to Washington, but it's not his tomb. So if anyone has any questions, you know, that's it please feel free. Thank you. <laughs>